Welcome back to I Am The Fire podcast. I've got my man, Alex Sandal, Strength of Sard, back in the podcast nice. studio. How are you? Face to face. That's that's how it should be, man. Yeah, it is way better, actually. It's I much do better. Like it. It's very cool. Uh, we're chatting today on programming. Yeah. Funnily enough, we had a conversation the other day and we started talking shop. I think we just went on a bit of a tangent. Mm. I started talking to you about your training you're doing. I sort of was explaining I'm on this new little health kick of training and sort of challenging myself to just have a bit more priority and focus around my training and diet. And then we started talking. I was like, wait, stop. Let's do a podcast. Let's break down, build a little program for myself and then talk about some of the key fundamentals um, that people can sort of take away. I've learned a lot from my time, you know, around guys like yourself and Woodford around programming and how that could work for different goals. But um, I think if we can give some people awareness of how to construct something for themselves based on what they're trying to achieve, and then I can map out my own one. It's a uh, killing two birds with one stone. Okay. So, all right. This is a big kind of topic, programming. Yes. Like, where do you begin? Massive. Programming periodization, okay? And it's all predicated, predicated on a couple of questions. One, do you even have a program? Because a lot of people don't yeah. even have a map. Okay, so the map is just, okay, you can go from where you are to the other side of the city. You can just try and get from like, I don't know, Manhattan or New Jersey to Brooklyn. But it's going to be very difficult and take a lot of time and be probably pretty stressful and exhausting if you don't have a map or GPS to get there. So the program, that's the map for us. Mm -hmm. So, but the question before we design the map is, what are we training for? So if we're going to do this for you, Shandor, okay, and the people at home listening... You have to ask, this is why people hire coaches because they do all of this, what we're about to do. We have to ask, what are we, what are we training for, okay? I've seen you go through a whole variety of different programs mm. when you're playing NRL and be trying to build muscle and when you were younger. What are we doing it now for? You got to tell me. Yes, that is a great point and that is the perfect place to start. So what is the outcome because that's going to dictate the program. Yes. So for myself, I would, I think I see it as a bit of a, move that around for you. In case you get caught. Yep. I see it as a bit of a hybrid. So I think if I, I'd have to break it down into like three sections. So first I would say aesthetics and lean muscle gain mm -hmm. would sit as the top priority. Got it. Second to that would be a maintenance level of strength. And third to that would be plugging in some sort of performance aspect. So I want to be, I don't, I don't want to be a bodybuilder. I want to be an athlete, but I want to be an athlete that looks like a bodybuilder. Absolutely. So that's that's the nature of the program, but that's the list of priorities. So does that help you dictate to what we're trying to do? You know what? Let me almost, I'm, I'm glad I brought my laptop. Let me almost write this out, okay, just so I can get a framework of what we're working with. So yes. your number one priority is, and this is for a lot of people going to have this, mm -hmm. right? Lean body mass. Number two is uh, maintenance of strength. Yes. And number three is... What are, we, what are we calling it? Performance? I would... Because uh, it's like, it's, it's that plugging in the athletic performance is like still maintaining speed and power and yeah. those sorts of things. And absolutely we can do that. And I have kind of clever ways that uh, I like to implement that in the context of a hypertrophy, bodybuilding style, muscle accrual phases. Okay, so mm -hmm. number one, lean body mass. So how much and how long we need to now define a specific goal. And people like, whatever goal you have, like you need to do this now, okay? What's the severity of your the outcome that you want to achieve? How much of it do you want to achieve? Do you know a, f a physical look that you're trying to attain or how much gains you're trying to achieve? No. Do you, is it super important to put a metric around it? It's helpful okay. because then we can have steps and markers to get towards where we want to get to. Uh, if you want, where exactly in Brooklyn are we traveling to? Mm. Where, what street? Or are we just trying to get a general in this direction? Yeah. Are we able to tr do, take the, in that general direction, we can. train for it, but without having the focus fully be on the metrics? Yes. Okay. And then we will, but we'll measure the metrics as we go along in our program, which will give us a guide on the progress we're making. Yes. So, okay. The next question is, what else are you doing? So I know you box a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we have to work, like training is a stress. Yeah, this was a great part, plug in for the conversation. But this is the, what we're talking about over the phone yeah. briefly, okay? You have to manage your training volume and loads 
around your lifestyle and ability to recover. Mm. If you are sleep deprived, if you are constantly stressed, if you are burdened by a toxic environment, then you are building and you have an environment that is very counterproductive towards making uh, effective, efficient, physiological, psychological progress. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you, you actually, you, where do you sit on that spectrum? It seems like you sit relatively low. You're in control of your time and your stress. Yes. Yeah, I would say generally, yes. I mean, I'm in a good place with that sort of stuff. One thing I would say is like, for example, I like to train. Mm. I want to train because I like to train but I want to train because I have the ability to maintain discipline and consistency and it's a priority for me. Yep. I said to you, along with other things, I want to do weight six times a week, which yep. is great. And I probably could do that if I really, really wanted to. Would it be detrimental to the, the gains I'm trying to get? Yes, it would. So straight away, what you just said was a great indicator for me because I am boxing. Mm. I am doing weight training. I do have stuff going on. But generally, I have control of my lifestyle environment and I'm in a good place. So really, the main, the key main stresses for me are going to be the training, mm -hmm. which is good to note because you can sort of plan around that from more of a physical level exactly. because I'm not going to have too many other contributing factors. Other people may have, you know, um, extreme work situations or like you said, be under stress, having a shit time, whatever, and it's all going to contribute. But I would say I have that under control and we can use the training to sort of dictate that, I would say. And, and let's point out that you're probably an outlier. Like me and you are probably outliers mm. in that sense where our training and health can take a major priority in our life, mm. but there's going to be plenty of people who I can't. No. Okay, so you need to consider those other factors because if you cannot recover from the stimulus and stress you're putting on your body, then the question is, should you really be doing it? What worth does it really have? Mm. Because more is not better. Yes. <laughs> you know, you said six days a week. Why six? Why not five? Why not mm. seven? Why not eight? Mm. Why not two a days? Mm. So this, the answer to that question is predicated partly on your lifestyle and how much other stress you're placing on your body. So you're boxing four times a week, okay? So that already tells me, well, that sounds like a high priority. So I'm going to box three times a week. Okay. So I figured that um, ideally, two things that I figured. Now we can we can touch on this. How we're going to break down my weight training? Yep. At the moment, this week I just trialed a mini trial on a on a schedule. I did a push upper body, a push legs, a pull upper body, a pull legs. Cool. With three boxing, Sunday off. Um, what did I do? So Monday I did boxing and I did push upper body. Yep. Then I did legs. Then I did boxing just alone, standalone on the Wednesday. Now, now on Wednesday. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yep. Today I did legs. Yep. Tomorrow I'll do um, upper body mm -hmm. and boxing. And then Saturday and Sunday I'll have off. Okay. So that's what I do this week. So when you have two a days, which is what we call what you explain when you're mm -hmm. training twice in one day, refueling and nutrition becomes particularly important on yes. those days in between bouts yep. to optimize performance, particularly, actually, it's not even relevant to you uh, because you're <laughs> still on a predominantly meat-based diet. Yes. Okay. But so uh, then I would say if you're not on a meat-based diet, if you have all macronutrients to a flexible extent, then fueling yourself adequately, particularly with enough glucose, carbohydrates, is very important in between bouts. Mm -hmm. Okay, we see that performance detriments do occur if there's not, if you haven't adequately restored your muscle liver glycogen stores in between bouts. Now, for you, you need to just prioritize enough amino acids, which will get converted by gluconeogenesis in between bouts, hydration, electrolytes. Mm. Okay, but that's kind of a side note. And the one thing about that boxing is it's not it's not the typical riggers that I would have been used to in like a training camp sense. Okay. I'm utilizing it more. Think about it more of like a personal training session. I go in, I do maybe, you know, 10 minutes of skipping. I'll do third, say 25, 25 minutes high intensity on the pads, which is a high intensity effort. It's like a hit, basically a hit session. And then I'll jump off and I'll do some rounds on the bag. So it's not like... How long is the hit? Uh, so you say you know, hit session's usually, what, 30 to 40 minutes, typically, in a group training space. Okay, cool. So I'm doing like a hit session and a weight session on those days. It's not an hour and a half full-on boxing conditioning blowout, which there are ends of the spectrum. So think about it more of like a 30 to 40-minute hit session. Okay. So on a scale, could you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10 of how stressful 
and fatiguing it is on your body? No, nah, it's it's really not because it's I'm doing the pad work, um, I'm not getting punched, and I'm not doing rounds. So it's like it's just like a little high intensity. If you were to put yourself through a high intensity conditioning session just to get that, that's that's what it is. So I don't see it as like crazy, you know, like training for footy would be like a nine a normal boxing session and, and, and it's all out intensity would be a nine. This would be, you know, I'd set it at a seven. Okay, good to know. So in that case, one being with weight training and lean body mass is the priority, then I would put weight training as a priority. You can justify this both ways, but I would put weight training as a priority first in the day. Okay. However, learning new skills, technic- learning new technical mm. skills it is a very poor environment if you're in a fatigued state to learn those skills. So mm. You definitely want to make sure there's enough time between activities, between sessions to when you go do that boxing, mm. okay? But to optimize performance, if that is the priority, I would put weight training typically first. However, if it's not particularly fatiguing your boxing, you could even potentially justify it as a bit of a uh, warm-up preparatory uh, activity before your weight training if it's mm. particularly short. Yeah, well, bro, when I was doing that training camp, when I was in, um, you know, for the actual fight, mm. I was going to Woodford doing a strength session for an hour, half a, like 45-minute break, having breakfast, going to boxing and doing an hour and a half there. You know what I mean? That was – that's that's more full-on. That's mm. taxing. You're stuffed. But the other thing – the reason why I want to plug in the boxing that's relevant again to like a lifestyle choice and now is because it's accountability – I'm not going to the gym by myself. I'm going to the gym to be coached. Mm. I get it gets me up early in these cold winter days. So like it has other benefits. You know what I mean. So on those days where I do box, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, getting like d- doing it first is probably the way I'd go. Well, see, in this case, you throw the science out and you'd be like, yes, mm. do that, mm. regardless of whatever scientific nerd justification we have. Yes, like it has other benefits to you that outweigh the ideal world of whatever physiology yeah, 100%. justification we have. So awesome. Yeah. We keep doing that. Yeah, cool. We just make sure we refuel adequately, give a couple enough hours in between bouts. Mm-hmm. We're good. So next, now we have to figure out, okay, what's the optimal volume and dosage and stimulus that you need mm-hmm. to make the gains that you want to make? Yeah. So one, we need to be in a caloric surplus. Yeah. Okay. The law of thermodynamics, we need more energy coming in than out in order to accrue accrual muscle mass. Okay, that's a separate conversation on nutrition, but that's the most basic of yes, basic. Yes. Next is we need adequate amount of volume to provide enough stress and stimulus to your body to break down, and then you don't rec- you're not making gains in the gym. You're breaking down in the gym. Mm. I think it's this concept where people think the harder they work, the more, the more, yeah, the more. It's a great line. It's a what? It's a great line. It's oh. good. It's perfect. It's the easiest takeaway, a way to explain it. So we need to find this optimal range of dosage for you. Mm-hmm. And if you're listening, you need to find the optimal dosage for you. And it's going to be predicated on the fluctuations of your life, mm-hmm. your, the, the phases of your life, the stress of your life. So, okay, if we want to accrue muscle mass, we typically look at Krieger's volume landmarks. If you don't know him, James Krieger is a researcher, scientist, uh, coach, and he came up with these ideal volume landmarks. How many sets do you know you should do? Yeah, exactly. Like that's a question so many people have. How many sets is enough? Well, let's try and answer that question here because that the, the, the sets will underlie the total volume that we will apply as a stress to your body. You need adequate volume to provide enough stimulus. You need to fill the cup up enough. So he found... And we typically find this as well, myself and other coaches anecdotally, that six to eight sets per body part, Mm -hmm. per session, and around 12 to 18 sets per body part per week. That is the range plus minus 25%. You know, it could be 20 sets for some people, could be 10 sets for other people on a body part that we approximately need to maximize and optimize muscular hypertrophy. So, okay, what does that look like throughout a week? That could look like anywhere between 70-ish to 100-ish sets of total volume per week, okay? We spread that out. We could spread that out ideally over around five. You could, we could do six sessions if needed, but we want to be careful about can we recover between yeah, each yeah. bout. 
So we would start there. So now we have the volume piece between 70 to 100 sets. I typically start conservatively, mm-hmm. particularly if we go into a bodybuilding world because we're going to use a lot of machine based movements mm-hmm. to gain a machines are What do you think about machines? I don't Cuz we started, I don't know about you, I started with the opposite view that machines were pretty crap. You, you were dogmatic in that foundational barbell compound movements that were ground-based, Christian Woodford, Woodford Sports Science <laughs> Consulting style. That's the way. Yeah. But I've uh, had a very big change of perspective in the last couple of years. I think as we all know, there's no one way. Mm. That's the actual key. There is no, not one, not all of one thing is the best way. There's, you can, like, you could take a piece out of everything. So machines, especially in a fully hypertrophic focused uh, training session, great, great tool. Pin loaded, you don't have to worry about a spotter. You can really control the modifications in terms of tempo, um, volume. I love, I think they have some great uses. And the, the predetermined path of yep. the machine takes away a lot of risk factors for people. Awesome. So it's you definitely just don't throw it away and not use it. And I think, especially in the setting that we're talking about, it has a use for sure. You man, you already mentioned like multiple things that are really important. That's awesome. Yes. Okay. We a, a lot of populations tend to uh, a lot of a lot of coaches, especially the athletic based strength and conditioning coaches, have tended to push the usefulness of machines aside. But I'd like to highlight that a combination of mm. both free based movement, body weight, calisthenic type movement, and machine based uh, co- a coalescence of the two can really create for a total athlete. Because yes. that's a still a priority for you too. Yes. So a lot of the movements we would be doing would be utilizing, because what's so great about machines is, like you said, you can push to failure mm-hmm. very safely. Yes. Okay. And they, because they provide support and stability to isolate certain muscle groups to a very high specific extent. I would actually put them too as my priority. Isolation and the ability to push for failure. I think those are the two biggest things out of a machine. Oh, and, and guess what? 100%. That's, those are two variables that are very, very highly important in order to maximize hypertrophy. Exactly. Now, I talked to you about it on the phone, but particularly pushing close, to a, a quarter, we call it the proximity to failure. Mm-hmm. How close do you get to failure? Okay. Typically, I use a reps in reserve model. So how many reps in reserve do you have? Okay. You ask yourself at the end of every set, okay, how many more reps could I have done? And a lot of people struggle to answer this question, particularly if they're new to weight training or training in general, Mm. because it's a body self-awareness. But one way you do it is by actually pushing yourself to complete muscular concentric failure. So I can't get it back up and you can do that safely with machines. Then you know, and this will change too as Mm. you get stronger. And then what's very, very, very important. If you look at a lot of the hypertrophy research out there, we see that proximity to failure, staying under around the three reps in reserve and under range is that sweet spot that we need. We need, we need to produce enough of a stimulus, enough metabolites, enough muscular damage, enough metabolic stress in order to facilitate the environment uh, chemically in the body to produce hypertrophy. And we notice that the underlying variable to that is getting close to failure. Mm -hmm. I think there's this, again, dogma of like, you shouldn't always push to failure. No, you shouldn't always push to failure. You should have a a systematic, logical, sequenced approach within your periodization to get you there over the weeks. Mm. So for a program, really any typical hypertrophy or periodized program, we start off the first week, say of a six-week program, we'll start off around three to four reps in reserve. Mm -hmm. And then every week we slowly lower it. And that means the intensity gets higher. Mm -hmm. So week one, three to four reps in reserve. Uh, The next week could be three reps in reserve, two, one to two, one to zero, a deload or repeat, depending on how you're, you know, depending on how you've adapted to that stress. Yeah. So now we have built this beautiful curve of 
adapted stress response within your body. We haven't shocked your body and gotten you sore for a week and now you can't provide enough mechanical tension and, st- and stress to your body. You've kind of really set yourself back a week. DOMS muscle soreness is a useful feedback tool, but it's counterproductive if it hangs a yeah, lot. Yeah, it's not a badge around. of honour either for your workout. But I mean, did you have that when you were coming up? I don't know. That's probably common with a lot of I people. I think it's a common misconception, 100%, that yeah. if you're not sore, then you haven't worked hard enough or you didn't you didn't train correctly or whatever. So I th- don't get me wrong. It's the byproduct of many good sessions that I've had, but it's I think the perception around if you get DOMS, you've had a great session, that... Um, that sort of we need to break that myth. Yeah, and uh, if you just think about it in this, one of the senses is that you need three factors to hypertrophy: mechanical tension, yep. metabolic stress, muscle damage. Okay, and I'll I'll tr- I'll try and pull up a, a re- the research paper that cites that. And you cannot provide enough mechanical tension, total load. Okay, if you're sore, if you're sore, your ability to exert force and produce the same movement at the same quality at the same speed is dramatically reduced. But hold on, you need that environment, that mechanical load, in order to provide enough of a stimulus for the muscle to break down and like mechanotransduction is what we call it, and stimulate an effect for hypertrophy. So DOMS is a counterproductive if it stays around too long. Mm. And hence the want for you to prioritize progressive overload so you don't take away from your ability to... Focus on hypertrophy in your workouts. Now, that is an important note. Mm-hmm. That's an important... There's these principles to programming, mm-hmm. right? One of There's, there's uh, variability, there's progressive overload, there's specificity, there's detraining, reversibility. There's yep. all these different principles that a good strength and conditioning coach and coach will know, mm-hmm. okay? That's why you hire them, okay? Yep. So, one you mentioned there... Wait, what was it you said again? Progressive I, overload. Progressive overload. This is the idea that... Every week, approximately, there will be some metric and variable that will be overloaded. Mm -hmm. We gave the example of reps in reserve. As the intensity goes up, that's that's the progressive overload that's occurring. Your weight may stay similar and the same or may slightly increase, which is great. Mm -hmm. And this is an overload that's occurring to the the body systems, the muscular system, the nervous system, etc. We need this. You need to continually provide a increased dosage of stress because your body will adapt. The muscles will get bigger. The nervous system will become more efficient. Uh, tendons will become stronger and be able to handle more load. All of these great things. That's why people plateau. If they don't adequately provide progressive overload and then you need variability. Mm. Yes. Can't keep doing the same thing. You will reach a point of diminishing returns. I've got a great quote for you. Yep, uh, Dan DePasqua, our strength coach at Melbourne Storm, the yes. great man, the king. Yes. Um, he had a great quote, which he applied to a lot of players uh, who weren't, weren't thinking about what they were doing and he didn't want them to. Essentially... Uh, they didn't have either the awareness or the training level or experience to focus too deep into actually what is going on during your training. It's more about show up, get it done, work hard, get the result. And what he used to do within his programming within players subliminally to a point is variation without a deviation. And I just used to love that quote that he used to say. And basically what it means is, you're working, let's, you could use whatever exercise you want. A squat, a squat's a great example. And he's, um, he's, he's from the school of, what is that um, conjugate method? What's the gym they come up with that? The powerlifting gym? Uh, you're talking about Louis Simmons? Yes, Louis Simmons. So he's, a, uh, he's been over there a few times. He come, he's uh, from the school of Louis. But a great coach. But um, yeah, you look at West your squat. Side West side barbell. That's it. You look at your squat over a over a period of whatever weeks, months. Um, he's just training, changing the stimulus in variation of bar, whether it's a safety bar, hmm. box squat, um, front squat, you know, foot placement, whatever it is. Um, and I just thought it's it's just a really good reference to have with your program that um, you can plug that in without huge deviations to what you're actually doing. So I used to love that he used to say that. it was What was that line again? Variation without a deviation. Right. So 
what to kind of rephrase that it's like what that what i'm hearing there without a deviation is people one of the mistakes people make in their programming coaches just general uh, gym goers is they change the variables yeah. too often they're like they're, they're flipping the stress all the time squat um what then uh like they completely flip the movement pattern they might go to a lunge then they might go to a like back a belt squat then they might go to a i don't know a leg press mm. Stick with it. Yes. Just be patient. You can add variables without deviating completely off course with new exercises, new movements, exactly. new patterns, everything. Yes. And, and this is the fundamentals of like a good coach will understand this. Correct. Okay. So number one, let's say you're back squatting for a month, for a cycle. You're most likely going to be continue progressing. Most people are going to keep progressing throughout that six weeks. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. It's working. However, we're not going to deviate and straight flip up the movement. We're going to add a very, we're just going to slightly change the variable and people will be flipped out. You do not need much. No. I could literally go, I could go from a back, a back squat to a front squat. Yep. Or I could go even, even a smaller change. I could go heels elevated mm. and now I'm making more quad dominant, shifting your center of mass a little bit forward. That's it. Mm. I could go goblet squat. I could like... I could, yeah, I could go a belt squat. I could stay within the same squat pattern, but change the variation slightly. I could give you like half, there's already four variations, four months right there. But think about the small variations that you can change. The position of load, the tempo. What, they could do a, a month where you're doing long eccentrics. Exactly right. So, and then now you can become proficient and strong neurally like your nervous system become very like it's very important that we understand like motor behavior that's a very uh, important like motor learning motor behavior the nervous system uh within this conversation because your brain like training weight training is a skill mm -hmm. so you need to rehearse these patterns to get more proficient at them to build body self-awareness to build proprioception coordination inter and intramuscular coordination which is how our uh, muscles coordinate with our brain and how our muscles then efficiently recruit the requisite motor units and muscle fibers to trigger that contraction. It's not just visually getting better at the squat. There are things going on in the background that are occurring that we don't even realize. So stick with it. You don't need to flip and change so often. However, you need enough, just slight variation to push past plateaus. So that's another uh, principle of programming periodization. So that would be embedded in the program on a, like a long-term scale. Mm. So we've touched on volume. We've touched on, ah, reps. We talked about this on the phone yes. briefly. Brad Schoenfeld is the amazing hypertrophy researcher. He's one of the top researchers in the world in, in, this, in the physiology exercise science community. Just look to his research. He did a, a meta-analysis. Let me see if I can... 2017 meta-analysis. And he saw that hypertrophy can be elicted, created to a similar extent regardless of the rep range if the body was pushed to a close proximity to failure. Mm. Okay, let me see if I can give you the exact wording. So one, you need enough load, ideally above 60% of your 1RM. Yep. Okay, so we need enough mechanical tension. Number two, when all sets are performed to momentary muscular failure, measures of muscle hypertrophy are similar between low load and high load conditions. The findings indicate that maximal strength benefits are obtained from the use of heavy loads, while muscle hypertrophy can be equally achieved across a spectrum of loading ranges. Excuse me across a spectrum of loading ranges as well. So three to five reps, six to eight reps, 12 to 15 reps. Like we see it all hypertrophy because, mm -hmm. but you need to push to muscular failure mm -hmm. or close to it. So this is this underlying principle that really facilitates uh, hypertrophy. So that's going to be embedded in our program. But now we kind of realize that, oh, yes, a rep range is important because what if we want to stimulate power and speed? Like, yeah, that becomes a pretty important because- yep. I need to perform high velocity movements at relatively low loads in a dynamic way with a maximal ideal recovery. So that would be embedded in your program as well. Cause I know you talked about, I still want to be athletic, mm. powerful. 
One method, if this is important to you, one method I would really encourage in the context context of a bodybuilding hypertrophy program, because like I, I still do it. I still want to be able to move, jump, run, land, yes. be powerful. Yes. And it's going to help you anyway in your training, improving your rate of force development, improving your ability to store and release elastic energy is going to improve the potential you have to exert force and strength and therefore improve your potential gains. So before you go into your pin-loaded chest press, your, your plate-loaded uh, push, pr- whatever, uh, your, your, your hack squat, you want to think about, okay, what vector am I operating in? Okay, is it vertical up and down or is it horizontal like a bench press or is it vertical like a squat? And then you want to try and match that vector with a low load, mm-hmm. so light, body weight, explosive movement, or you could do the same movement with low load done in a really explosive manner for low reps. For example, two variations. If I'm doing a hack squat, a belt squat, or whatever, machine. All right, vertical vector, somewhat. Hack squat's like diagonal. Yep. So I could think about doing a counter movement jump or a static jump, depending on the tempo of my hack squat, because the counter movement jump, if I'm just doing a, a hack squat and I'm just coming in and out, mm. right? Okay, a counter movement jump is going to be a bit better because store and release elastic energy. But if I'm doing a pause, a static jump might be a bit better to get me uh, strong from a dead stop. And I'm just going to do under five reps approximately, explosive as possible, and give myself a couple of minutes rest and recovery. And now what I've done is... Theoretically, I have potentiated my nervous system, which I know you're probably familiar with this term from Christian, potentiated my nervous system in order to exert more force at a faster rate. Mm. Okay, it's like, uh, it's kind of the opposite of picking up a heavy, heavy rock and then putting it down and then picking up a light rock and throwing it. It's kind of the flip on on, on on the other side of that. And so now we can train our rate of force development. It can be explosive. It can be a great way to stimulate the nervous system, potentiate the nervous system, and kind of like, you know, it really like ex- excites your brain and body. Mm. Like you feel more energized, yeah, ready to go. And that that could be the number one. It could be at the tail end of your warm up, and you could just do one to three sets there, or you could also use it in between your sets before the main work set. For example, another example, I'm doing a maybe a plate loaded uh, chest press mm-hmm. on my warm up set. Don't go light. I'm sorry. Don't go slow. Move with intent. Like yes, the first couple reps you can be greasing the groove, just feeling out the movement. But at some point, I want explosive four to six reps as fast as you can. Mm. Break that machine. Mm. Rate of force development. You're getting super high velocity, and then rest. I'm not going to fatigue. Fatigue is a terrible environment to produce speed and power. Yes. We know that. It, it, it like builds hydrogen ions and inhibits nerve conduction. Not good. We don't want that. No. And then you give yourself, you want to give yourself enough rest because you just, you think about phosphocreatine, which is the part of the ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate, which participates in energy production. It is energy. You, you want to give yourself, not, like you think about, 90 to 120 seconds ish rest, maybe a little more if you have it. The more highly trained you are, like you, the more rest you'll need because you you're more efficient. Your body's more efficient. You're recruiting more motor units, more muscle fibers. And then you go ahead and do your work set. Now you could do that multiple times in one session. So you could eventually get like three to five sets of powerful, high velocity, low load movements. And you're kind of building in this, as Louis Simmons, West Side Barbell say, dynamic effort yes. into the program that's hypertrophy. So now you can get a bit of both worlds, but we're not sacrificing the hypertrophy. We're not doing an entire day that's just dedicated to speed and power movements. We're building it in into our warm-ups. Mm. The warm-up yeah, sets okay. can be that. So now we're more efficient. Training economy is really important. We don't need to be... Because typically, certain the condition, we break it down. We'll start the day with three sets of, or five sets yeah. of powerful movements, and then we'll go to this, then to that. You don't have to do it like it's that. It's really segmented. Yeah. Mm. We, we can uh, kind of merge them together. So I think that's how I, we answer part of the question of, well, how do I maintain, but even build qualities? Because I bet there's a lot of people listening who have never even done a counter-movement jump. Mm. They never even 
like really lifted as explosively as possible. No, a hundred percent they wouldn't have. So that's a skill of in itself. Mm. Ideally, you want to be coached through it because you really you're really not going to be exposed into those environments unless you're in some sport. sort of yeah sport or performance. Uh, but I would say there some of the other some of the other low load methods from a strength and conditioning based environment, the use of like a med or dead ball. Yeah. Oh, I think is great. Awesome. Low load plyometrics, I think are also great. You know, things like that are a good starting point. Maybe not something I would go for based on the conversation we had about my training experience and level, but I think that's a great plug in for people. Dead balls, low load plyometrics. Right. I think they're a great start. And that's probably pretty safe. Yeah. And if I was there realistically, I probably would go warm up, Power sets, roll into my session. And you could do that. Yeah. Like you could do a hybrid. One day you could do that. The next day you could be like, I don't know, what do your what did your session look like today? What movements you do? What did I do? I had I did I did lower body push today. So I did some squats, mm -hmm. uh, bubble back squats, uh, no box. No, no commercial gym has bought those medium rigid boxes. It does my head in. Because I like box squatting. I yeah, do. Yeah, I prefer yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not looking to find an end range under underneath parallel. So it works for me. I I like it. It takes it's just, it's just safe. It's good. I, I really like it. It gives good reference point. Um, it's definitely for, not as stressful in your nervous system or tendons. No, nah, for me it works. But then, you know, it's not the worst thing that I'm pushing myself around those movements with full range and, and, and freedom without the box, you know. Uh, so I did that. I did the barbell back squat. Then I went into um, just mixed it up. I did a single leg uh, leg press. And then I did some knees over toes. Um single leg split squats nice um and then i did like 100 reps of goblet sissy squats got it so, so a little bit of a finish up just in there and yeah a little blowout yeah i've been i've been running this sort of dorian yates method um for the last like a while just because I, I watched a youtube and i just i kind of enjoyed it just basically coming in pretty much three sets on each exercise rolling in and doing like a 12 rep three second tempo um, quite heavy. What's this done? This is up. Twelve reps, three second tempo. Uh, quite heavy, pushing to like, say, rep reserve of like three or four. That's mm -hmm. the sort of weight I'm at. Then the next one will be like an eight to a ten with a weight increase, and then the next one will be like six reps and failure. But it's all applied with the three second eccentric tempo as well. The ne you say the next, the next session, the next the exercise? The next set. So I'll do three sets oh, and that'll okay. be how it ro ro range. So like 12, 10, 6, Got it. and you're reaching muscular failure with the applied modification of a tempo of three seconds. So it's pretty hardcore, but you're still, you're still throwing around some good weights. I, ju I, I go through phases, but I do like the use of tempo and eccentrics. Um, Absolutely. So, but again, I think there's room for hybrid modeling throughout the session as well yeah and we could go face to face like we know eccentrics are critically important for stimulating enough muscle damage to yeah. produce the hypertrophy response like the east like the reason why one big reason i should say the reason why you get doms people get doms is because during the eccentric phase the most amount of muscle damage is occurring yeah definitely that's why we, we actually used to avoid them in footy training in your weight training yeah Obviously, just because we couldn't afford to be exactly. sore and then match those efforts on the field. Yeah, so this is a great point. This is how you can now manipulate your training and programming accordingly depending on your needs. If you can't afford to be sore, oh, okay, I'm probably going to give you like a prowler or something, something like concentric dominant, mm. a step up uh, with a quick step down. Um, I'm going to be kind of clever about the way I program these things because well, I don't want that in, to impede on your comp competition. No, no way. So you could do that in your own programming as well if you – like it's the example of like people, you know, you do the thousand steps Kokoda trail uh, in the Daniel Ranges or whatever. You, you go walk up hills then you have to come back down. Mm. It's not the uphill that made you sore. It's the downhill, however many kilometers. It's like a, you have to, uh, there's a breaking force. Every step, your quads have to eccentrically, eccentrically contract for multiple seconds each step. Man, that's going to build up a lot of muscle damage over the course of like 10, 20, 30 minutes. So it wasn't the up so much. It was the yeah, down. 100%. I think it's just a good ana like analogy. Yeah, and it's good for people to understand that as well. Yeah. So now it's okay. We can spread that, your program over five, six days. For you, you talk about, a, you gave the example of a back squat. So you, I think you're still, it sounds like you're still in this kind of f like functional, like 
compound, multi-joint, like athletic type of base program, mm. okay? But still with the consideration to push to failure and to stimulate enough uh, stress yes. to get hypertrophy. However, man, you have proven, your, I think there's a competency that one needs to build in foundational m- movement patterns that I typically look for. For example, if you're a new client of mine, it's like I'm going with a, a motor learning skill acquisition, unilateral stability-based priority first. If I haven't seen you train, then we're going more of an accumulation block where we're building a lot of volume and cross-sectional area of the muscle because a bigger muscle has the potential to be a stronger muscle. Mm-hmm. So increasing the cross-sectional area of that muscle is what we want so we can then produce a higher potential of force. Then we might go into more of an intensification phase, jack the load up, drop the overall uh, rep range and volume, perhaps. That's generally how I begin with people who haven't seen train before. Mm. You, no, I've I've seen it. Like we documented it. Like you have exerted an extreme amount of competency. You can squat two times body weight, deadlift two times plus. Mm. We've ticked these main boxes. Now, if you haven't ticked those boxes, I would encourage people to... If you've never trained before and you just start using machine weights, you have you learned how to brace? Can you balance on one leg and stabilize? Can you breathe effectively under heavy load? What do you do if you, like, do you have enough ankle mobility, thoracic mobility, uh, stability through the glute med, strength through the, the, the external rotators of the hip? All these weak points that a lot of people uh, get exposed to, which increase your propensity for injury, which just you can't get it, you won't get as much out of your training and the, the response that you're trying to get yeah, if you haven't built some of these key foundational pillars. So, Shando, you're an example of someone who's done all this. Mm. So, actually, I would strip you away. I wouldn't squat you with a barbell anymore. All right, man. Have, have you have you uh, used uh, a hack squat before or a uh, pendulum squat before? Yeah, they're good. <laughs> they're rough. <laughs> yeah, they're if you load them heavy, like because yeah, they're they're so useful because you use the back support. Mm. And now the difference between a, if you go a back squat to failure barbell versus like a pendulum or hack squat to failure, there's pretty significant differences in the specific stimulus of stress you feel. For example, when you start to push failure in a squat, barbell uh, squat, you start to notice other synergist and fixator muscle groups. These are muscle groups that basically support uh, the main agonists, the main muscle groups in the movement. You start to notice they start to creep up and give you some discomfort, pain, or just general um, awareness, yeah. fatigue. Lower back. Uh, we start to notice... Yeah, lower back's probably a big one in lower the squat. Lower back's probably the big one, yeah. Um, you could argue... Yeah, knees, <sighs> hips... Hips and groin, I'd say, is another one for a lot of people. Yeah, adductors start to yep. take over, especially if you go past parallel. So if you compare that to... But the back is a big one, and then it distracts you. We know pain inhibits muscular activation. We've, we've done the studies on that. We've done EMGs on people. If, like, if you experience pain and discomfort uh, during a exercise set, not only is your mind-muscle connection going to be poorer, and people might think, my muscle connection, that's like a bodybuilding bro thing. No, it's that's... That's actually really important mm. for driving enough neural drive and uh, muscular activation to that tissue. We need that. Pump, also very important. So good, really, some research on, on how I even mean, pumps can be uh, a really good indicator that you're driving enough metabolites uh, to facilitate the environment that helps hypertrophy, okay? That's not done very effectively through, typically through foundational compound, you know, barbell squats, uh, what else have we got? Like uh, lunges, uh, split squats. I think they're 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 decent, but again, they well, re- realistically on those points, most compound movements aren't heavily shifted towards those things. So you know, pump, etc. Like yeah. most compound movements, that's not going to be the feeling or goal associated with that. And the one reason is because they're relatively unstable compared to. Uh, when you use machines. Mm. So that relative level of instability is what is really useful for athletic populations, for people who want to become a bit more functional, reduce their chances of injury. That's why we go there first. But now we come over to the machines, we have a back support, we have chest support if we're doing rows. Now we can isolate a specific muscle group really safely and effectively. And now, now synergists and fixators don't take over anywhere near as much because those synergists and fixators are supported like they're supported with the bench or rather 
the agonists, your, your, like your axial skeleton, your body, your torso, your back is given enough stability where you can drive like a really, like if you go on a hack squat, a pendulum squat, like man, or leg press, like you go that to failure, your quads are blown up. Yeah. Because you have enough support and stability to provide that adequate stimulus. And that's what we want, right? If, if I'm looking to optimize the hypertrophy response, I want that. So that's where for you, I mean, I would skew you heavily towards like these really intelligent machines. Like I'd go machine, uh, like Watson do an awesome, um, if you access Watson equipment, a muscle, a gyms like Muscle City, like they have awesome machines that I, are able to give you enough support, but like mechanical disadvantage to drive a really strong stimulus through the target muscle. So that's where I take you exercise selection wise. And it wouldn't be trying to find like, what exercise do I pick? Like, I don't, if you're getting a category of movements, I think that's more important than yeah, the yeah. specific type. For sure. I think exercise selection, I can plug and play a little bit, but yeah, definitely. And it's important to note that, like you said, I have gone through a you know vast range of training experience, working my way through my own body awareness, through stability, through the skill and movements uh, in different muscular groups um, and different movement patterns. So I've done all that. I've, I've experienced that. I've reached the peaks of what we would say are good metrics around strength. So my ability and the options for me to go towards some machines and be able to f- properly utilize those towards my goals, totally. I'm in a position to do that. Absolutely. That doesn't, It's not going to apply to everyone. Like you said, it's really important people go on a journey of understanding, building strength in key areas around instability, around compound movements. So this isn't like a one size fits all type deal, no. but given where I'm at, if you looked at the long context of my all my training experience, where I've been, what injuries I've had, what sport I've played, I'm at a position now where I can control my training environment. Yes, I enjoy doing boxing, probably the least taxing sport on my body if I'm not getting punched in the face. But otherwise, like generally pretty good. You could get a little bit of overuse stuff in the shoulder and neck maybe, but generally pretty good. You get some upper body soreness, a little bit of calf doms maybe, 10 minutes skipping will do that to you on the soleus. But otherwise, generally pretty good. And now I'm in the position in the gym where I'm not being told what to do. So I kind of can construct and design my own program. I'm not trying to facilitate that or I'm not trying to associate my gym work with my performance on the field which I did and everyone does, if you're feeling good, if you're training good and you're strong in the gym, you're feeling good, training good, and you feel strong outside on the field when you're playing your sport. Now I don't have to have that association. So I can build a program that speaks to my body, my lifestyle, my injury history, my goals, and puts me in a different bit of a different position. So I just thought that was important to note. Um, around why I'm making some of the choices I'm making for my program. Yeah, because people might be tempted just to copy and paste what we're hearing. Yeah, exactly. And it's just it's just important to give some context as to why these are good options for me. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And and just put into perspective, like this is where I'm at. So it's a good it's a good point where I can build my program and just be like, hey, this is what I want to get out of this. This is what I want to get out of that. And that could easily completely be flipped if I had different goals, different exactly. wants, different needs. You know what I mean? This is the individualization piece. Yes. Uh, of, a, of a principle of programming that we apply. Mm. Okay. It's, it's, it's an important key because it gives us context, but it's not this idea of like, oh, you need to, every new program you write needs to be this super unique thing. Mm. Like there are templates mm. that are very effective that mm. work. There are, you, as coaches, as health professionals, as a human beings, you develop systems that work and I have systems that work very well for hypertrophy mm. and I can tailor that, make some adjustments to you, mm. but we know what works mm. and we don't need to reinvent the wheel for no, every new client. Exactly. And to your point, I think it's important to note that I do strongly urge everyone to work under a program. It's well good to have great intentions and be like, I'm going to the gym, be consistent around that. That's great. But to not have any structure, to not be able to tap into methodologies like progressive overload and be able to actually gauge, and because it is important, if you're not progressing in, um, I forget the term you use, but if you're not progressing in weights or uh, reps or sets, then that's an issue. And if you can't measure that, then that's also going to be an issue in your program and your progression. You know what I mean? So I would strongly urge 
and it's something I always used to want. Like I know I work good with a routine, mm-hmm. with a structure, with a program. Tell me what to do, I'll do it. And yeah. I know I kill it that way. Most people are the same. So I think it's really important that people seek out a program, something to follow, commit to it. That's probably the uh, the little T's and C's at the bottom. Make sure you commit to it. Don't try and flip it after one week. You heard something else, you want to try something else. Mm. Commit to something, really give it a good go. Um, yeah, I just think that's that's also really important. Absolutely. Uh the like being patient with that process mm. committing to it is huge and what gets measured gets managed mm. if you are got okay if you have expectations for change within anything in your life mon- monetarily business but health yep. wellness fitness here strength hypertrophy if you are going in and i've seen this before and you're just going in and doing Oh, whatever you feel in the day, mm. random actions get random results. Mm. Okay, I'm not saying you won't progress or you won't create a positive change, but you're just walking through the streets in the general direction. If I now give you a program, you're going to get there faster with less stress, more efficiently, more effectively, and safer. Would you say it's a non-negotiable to record everything you're doing in those training days? Uh, Hundred <laughs> percent, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Like, hundred percent. Most people don't do that. Well, okay, hundred percent. That's why most people are average. Yeah, right. But that's a definition of average. Like most people, right? Yeah. And that's okay if you if you're fine with that. Like some people just train when they feel like it because it gives them a mental relief. Yeah, and they're probably not listening to this though. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> we might get a couple, right? Yeah, that's fine. F- for the people who want, who are driven to make change, mm. you like every me. Like I could tell you every set of every rep for the last, I don't know, about nearly 10 years. Yeah, that's right? crazy. Whether it's written programs or whether it's now everything's on, on spreadsheets for me. And I have some killer, like the programs that I started with of like how we break it, like Google Sheets, Excel, like you can do some wicked stuff with yeah. it, man. Like we can, I can like, we've worked with some uh, really great uh, Excel spreadsheet nerds, right? Where we have automatic, uh, cells that highlight and colorize when uh, you go up in load or whether you stay no. the same or whether you go down. So you know very clearly like what's changing. You can categorize based on muscle groups. It makes it super, like it's fucking awesome. Man. Bro, what do you think that is? Do you think, you know, it's like, are we getting old? Are we getting like deeper into business? Like that shit excites me, eh? An Excel spreadsheet, like with color coding, Oh man, it just it gets me so excited. <laughs> it's like I don't know. It's Those like, are the things I get excited about these days: structure, systems. Oh, sh- after this, after oh, we're done, I'll it. show you what I have for nutrition. Automation, man. yes, Stop it. yes. Because it. now, now we can make better decisions, mm. quicker decisions. That's another thing. Data, give me all the data. I want to, I want to see it. I want to understand it. Right. And I want to make my decisions based off the back of it, one hundred percent. So now it's it's not just all that we don't just like usable data, yes, right? We're not just yes. trying to record for the sake of recording. No. But it's like, tell me what we can use, okay? I want to measure your sleep. I want to measure your, like, if we need to, your hydration, if that's a problem. But your nutrition, your sleep, because you're, look, if you're trying to make these changes, that number one biggest, I don't know, a pill for creating positive changes in your health is sleep. That's your superpower, okay? If that is diminished, like we see that people who are sleep deprived, six hours of less, I think the study was 5.5 hours, uh, 7.5, 8.5 hours. I put it on strength aside. You can see it there. Mm -hmm. For people who wanted to accrue muscle, they saw a significant difference in the amount of fat accrual versus muscle accrual in the people who were sleep deprived. So if you're trying to gain muscle mass and you're sleeping less than six hours a night, you are screwing yourself because you're going to put on a significant amount more of fat mass than muscle mass. I saw this when I went over and lived in Singapore over exchange. My sleep was never worse. But I was really? training like a maniac because I just I wanted I was I needed to come back a different person. Yeah, and I came back bigger and stronger and all that. But my sleep was like, I recorded it. It was like four hours a night. No way. But I was trying. I was trying, man. I was in bed for like eight, nine hours, but I slept terribly. Quality was terrible. The oh, bed. Would, I'd be dead. I was in a shoebox, man. The room's the size of a shoebox. I couldn't. Even, <laughs> Less than half the size of this room. No. Um, the bed was the mo- one of the most uncomfortable beds you'll ever sleep in. And I'm not trying to exaggerate. And it's hot. Mm. Singapore is hot and humid every day, right? And, and the, the you can't escape it. So it's a very poor environment to make gains in. So yes. I was in that situation. Now I was still training hard. I was still trying to eat a lot. And you could see 
that while I did put on my muscle mass, I put on a lot more fat mass. I know it's as an anecdote, and of one, you can look at the research if you want to see it. That's an example of like, you, you, you're going to go in the other direction a little bit. So sleep, and we could, that, that can be a whole other podcast. Yeah, of course. You're right? Maybe we'll do that. Mate, sleep is key. The, the biggest thing for me is just turn off my phone. Oh, I can, I, I have some of the best night, like I set myself up, go through my little sleep routine, have my bone broth with my reishi mushroom and all this other stuff. Sometimes I'll drop a little bit of, um, what's, uh, what is it? You naturally produce this when you sleep, Alex. Melatonin? Just had a mind blank. Yeah, sometimes I'll use a melatonin supplement. Not all the time because I also don't want to inhibit the natural production of that. But um, I have a good little sleep routine that I go through. Then I'll go to bed. Good intentions again. Great time. I'll look over. Don't touch your phone. Don't touch your phone. Don't touch your phone. Don't touch your phone. Touch your phone. It's on charge. Just leave it. Just leave it. You're sweet. Just go to bed. Read a book because you know when you read a book, you read half a page and for some reason it's yeah, like it you a off. sleeping tablet instantly. Yes. I'll just check Instagram. <laughs> Bang. One hour. One hour later. Hour and a half later, I'm like, oh, You're my God. Kidding. It's 11.30 midnight. It's a fucking joke. So, All right. And, you know, someone that's disciplined and just can't stay off his phone. So that's literally how easy it is for me. Go through my routine, put the phone away. Like, that's got to be – that's that's just got to be a plug-in to this program. It's We talk about this all the time. Don't tell me about how you're going to go and get a personal trainer. You're going to go and get a program. You're going to dedicate yourself to training in your diet. But then, because you don't see it as the major priority, sleep, mm. you're going to – you can't turn off your phone. There's no possible way you can put it away. You know what I mean? Like you're going to dedicate and make sacrifices in all of these areas. There's some that are maybe considered less of a priority, but equally, if not more important, you need to maintain discipline in those things as well. The smaller, minor things, not the training, not the heavy lifting, not the great diet. Turn the fucking phone off. Right. You know what I mean? Because if you don't, (laughs) It undermines all of the work you That's did. What I'm saying, and it's the little things. So that there's discipline and sacrifice areas need to be built holistically. So he, here's the thing: it gets me because like you work so hard in the gym, you're gonna train that hard, you're gonna you're gonna buy all this nutrition food, use all this money on gym memberships, and 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 what, maybe you use some wearable technology, your watches, your rings mm. to measure this and that. But you ain't even doing the basics. Yeah, <laughs> you, you get like we need to get to the. Are you sleeping good? Are you hydrating? Are you mindful? when you eat so what has worked well for you because I, I have an answer to this that's very simple atomic habits type stuff what has worked well to keep you off your phone because i would argue uh, the di- exerting discipline is important obviously but there's a way to do it where you don't even need to exert any effort willpower or discipline mm-hmm. like what if but before we get there what's worked well for you when you've done that habit good, like when you haven't... I've honestly never done it good. Okay, awesome. <laughs> i got one for you. Okay. Some sort of app that turns my phone off. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Some more apps, more technology. So when we talk about habits, we have a four-part uh, psychological framework to habits. A cue, craving, response, reward. Oftentimes, if you want to change a behavior, improve a, a behavior... You need to improve your environment and improving the environment means changing the cue. So for a destructive, unhealthy habit, we want to make the cue, whatever triggers us Mm -hmm. with the donuts on the bench, triggers a craving to uh, uh, being like start salivating and you start craving wanting to eat. Okay. The phone, looking at the phone cues you to pick it up. It's very dopaminergic. It's, it's, we pick it up, we get stimulated. We've associated with very positive feelings. Now, if that's interfering with your sleep as it is with you, like, man, that's that hour, 90 minutes, like now on the back end, you might be sleeping in more because, okay. Yes, that's 100% a byproduct. And that's, uh, you want to, I'd prefer you sleep more than get less, but that now eats into your day. Exactly. That's 90 minutes of productivity, a shit you could be getting after. Exactly. All right. That's money. That's life. That's time. All right. We're going to make this phone work for us instead of against us. You want to eliminate the cue or make it very hard and difficult. So, it's very simple. Before you enter your bedroom, Mm -hmm. the phone goes off. Okay. (laughs) But it doesn't ever enter your room. It goes on the other side of the home. The kitchen, whatever is the kind of the furthest compartment away, it goes in a drawer or a, a cupboard, something where you can't visually see it. 
So after you, what, what we have to do it after it, after something. So maybe the bathroom is probably the last place you enter yeah. before you go to your bedroom. Great. After the bathroom, you take that phone off, goes in cupboard. This is like a very simple thing. I understand, but it's it's dramatic in its effects. You eliminate the queue, and it doesn't ever enter your bedroom. You are not queued to pick it up because it's not there, and you're not going to get up out of bed once you're in it to go pick up your phone on the other side no, of the house. I'm not. The effort needed is way too higher than the reward. So what do you do? Oh, you, oh, there's a book there. The queue, now you have a positive queue. The book's there, you pick it up, you read it, you're down. If you want to change a destructive habit, you need to change and manipulate your environment for you instead of against you. One way to do that is to eliminate the queue. If you move the phone away, you eliminate the queue. Mm, yeah, I Try agree. that. Yep. Beautiful. And then we'll report back. All right. <laughs> I we'll like see. it, 100%. If it's not next to me in my bed, it's going to make it a lot easier. Exactly. I like that. No, but it's um, I can speak to that massively. One, yes, I wake up later and it's harder to wake up yep. and I don't want that. I don't want to lose productivity. Two, I notice it you know, three quarters of the way through the day. You hit a massive wall, which is unnecessary. You get that. It's just a simple – it's literally that hour and a half that I lose or two hours or whatever on the phone that if I made that up – it would completely change the spectrum of my day when I wake up with how much energy I wake up and how I'm a bit, my ability to attack the day. So absolutely, it's just one of those things. You know the answers, just do it. Yes. And that's what I always think. Like I honestly consider myself someone quite disciplined. But this, here's and then, the thing. And I'm still doing that. So like. <laughs> I'd fuck, like, fuck motivation and discipline, have good habits, environments, and systems. Mm. Like when I read Atomic Habits, it really kind of flipped my kind of approach. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good point. You don't have to try and apply discipline to no. everything. Just create the environment that, that, that that's not necessary. We yeah, have like that. prostituted discipline. Yes. We, we have sold it in our societies, this sexy, beautiful thing that to allure after. The best, most successful people in the world mm. are super disciplined. Jocko willing, discipline equals freedom. Jocko's right. Mm. But if you create an environment that has you running downhill instead of uphill, mm. what, what, like, wouldn't you prefer to do that? Mm. We glorify working really hard, but I would rather work smart yeah. and hard yeah, exactly. and consistently. Yeah, exactly. And no doubt you need discipline, but let's lower the number of things that you're applying discipline to. Right, because it gets exhausting. 100%. When yeah. you, you know, how, okay, this might flip people out a little bit. Um, I exert almost no discipline and motivation to train every day. And I've done it, for a very large amount of years that I won't even mention because maybe people won't believe me and it doesn't matter, mm. right? I don't exert discipline when I go out to train, when I go lead to the gym or run. Why? It's like, what's that about? A lot of people do. They have to like watch some video or get pumped up. One, it's a value, your value systems, like your identity. Who are you? Mm. I am the type of person that, Okay, I'm the type of person that seeks this physical discomfort every day. All right, so if I'm that type of person, then it's not a question of when I'm going to work out. It's like, it's going to happen. Like the what and the when, it's already sorted because it's part of, I've assimilated into my identity. So I think the first step forward is what type of person do you want to be and what actions do you need to then exhibit and what habits do you need to exhibit in order to be and become that person? So maybe, maybe you could fill in your own sentence. Like, oh, you talked about energy. Do you want to be the type of person that has booming energy all day, is productive, and is able to take most advantage of their time? Yes. Okay. And if that really is like resonates with you, you could create your own sentence. Mm -hmm. All right. What do those types of people do? Those types of people aren't on their phone at night in bed for ninety minutes. Mm -mm. That's that's the opposite. All right, so what do I need to do to be that type of person? Oh, eliminate the queue, get the phone out the room. But it starts at the type of person you want to be. That's where I'd begin. And yeah, I like it. Atomic Habits, James Clear, sets an amazing foundation for that. Makes sense. I like it. But we got onto this from sleep. Yeah, we did. Which is very important. Which we, which we yeah, we segued off the programming. And I think we were sort of just talking about 
the individualization and what things are important in parallel to the specific training program. And then we sort of finished on the fact that transitioning for myself from, for example, like a barbell back squat to a hack squat yeah. and why, why that path suits me and where I'm at, but why going through the experience um and the even even say the program of acquiring higher levels in the skill of a barbell back squat and increasing your strength metrics to a certain point why that journey would be super applicable to someone else something that a i've already been on and b i have competency with so for me the direction of moving to a machine based movement based on the goals that I'm trying to achieve makes sense. Yes. But I think it was just highlighting that point. Like all of these things need to be looked at individually um, across a broad spectrum of like where you're at, what you've done and what you want to achieve. And I think they will paint a picture exactly the same way we've painted a picture for you know the way I want to train in my program. Well said. Yeah. And the key piece is measuring. What gets measured gets managed. Yep. And if you cannot recover from the stimulus that you're applying to your body, we need to ask, is it worth it? You need to drop that down relative to what you can recover to because that's the main thing. Like if you can't recover from the stress you're applying, then you undermine all the work that you're putting in. Mm. So what point is it? That's, that's a great point. Now I'm going to plug this. We'll end up plugging this in a bit of a document. I think it'll be a really cool content piece actually mm. off the back end of it but let's start to break down some of the foundational structures of say me entering into a program as of next week okay how many days am i training so there's not going to be a we got th we got we got the the goal of three boxing sessions so we're going to try three boxing i would split you could train every day this idea that people can't train every day, you need a recovery day is bogus mm -hmm. Be because it's all predicated on the relative stimulus of the day and how much you can recover to. I'm an example of that. I've trained every day for a large amount of years, mm -hmm. okay? But I'm an N of one. I also have clients. Okay, I got some empirical data too. Anyway, we can spread out the volume over. So if you have three days, uh, what, we're going to have, we, if we have, if we train every day, then we're going to give ourselves a chance to minimize the two a days. So we're going to have one, two, three, four. Well, I'd probably have Sunday off. Okay, so that might be important to you. Is yeah. that important to you to have one day off yes. mentally? Yes. Okay, so in that case, we have six days to work with. Mm -hmm. I would split you up over, I would, I would train you then every day. You'd be resistance training five. You could do, I'd probably give you six. Uh, six five to six weight training sessions this is something that i would mm. test i think I this is something i would test for mm. a month and see what you respond better to and it can manage with your lifestyle but there's not gonna be no perfect number okay mm. we just have it we have 70 to 80 ish work sets we have to get through if we do less days there'll be more more volume on the same day if we do more days there'll be it's more spread out okay well if, let's just go off the path here and then come back because this may give some context to the question we're asking. What type of resistance training, what is the focus on those days? Is, ah. is it total body? To yeah. Is it isolation? Yeah. Is it push? Is it pull? What is it? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do body part splits. Okay. okay? If we're going to optimize poetry. I'm going to do body part splits. It helps the, the programming, the structuring, the format. Um, and we can target a number of muscle groups per day. And you know what? I might actually, like we can actually do this. Yeah. Like I might actually write you up a program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should. I think it'd be cool. You know? And then we can review it. Yeah. And see how we 100%. go. And I can do, I can show you the template. Yeah. That'd be wicked. So I'm going to give you the targets. Okay. One, I need to, I want to see body comp photos. Okay. I want to see like, okay, what's lagging? What body parts do we want to bring up? But maybe you can tell me before we even see that. Yeah, the lagging body parts, body parts that you want to prioritize. That's okay. a question. Yeah. Like, like chest, uh, lower body, extremities. Yeah. Because again, I think, and this is where my, the first question you asked me, I'm not, I'm not going down the path of like fitness model aesthetics, but I want to look good. So it's like, I'm, I'm saying to you, when you asked that question just then, you asked it in two parts and the later sort of, um, 
relate. I felt I felt 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 it was more relatable when you said like bringing up body parts. I'm not thinking about bringing up my um, rear delts and in this position, you know, or my or my the outer head of my triceps stuff like that. I'm thinking more so like okay. What with the first thing that comes to mind is okay. What injuries have I had? I know what injuries I've had, and it's brought down my like I've got uh, discrepancies. Say say my glutes. Like I know that when I'm not training in a professional environment, and some of the lower back stuff I've had, I'd like to bring up glutes. Same thing with my legs, hamstrings. I'd like to bring up hamstrings. And then you look at across the board. I know that because of my injuries, and I know that's been affected. If I'm looking at it from an aesthetic hypertrophy point, I want to bring up shoulders middle delt i want to have that's the that's the aesthetic look i want to have so it's not like well the point i'm trying to make is i'm going to a level of detail without going to say for example the level of a bodybuilding detail do you know what i mean it's more about saying okay what's the look you want it's the arms the shoulders the back so it's 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 that sort of feel but i also legs is important to me so it's about making sure that i tick off those as well got it naturally what 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 what, genetically what am i equipped with like i have a big chest um Mm. i have have a good back good lats um legs legs needs focus for me you know naturally i'm i'm a skinnier guy and then glutes glutes and all that that, that's important so that that's sort of if you would look at it from a look and arms um, that arms and shoulder beachy sort of look appeals to me more so now than maybe once upon a time because other things were a priority, more, more performance-based things. Got it. So now with that feedback, which is awesome, you communicated that well, mm-hmm. the first phase of your program would be a, like we break down the phases into specialty phases. Yep. So we have a focus. Okay. okay. You can go GPP and just go like general all round, yep. but you've built that foundation. So now the first phase would very likely be focused on a leg specialization. So we would skew the volume with your extremities, with your legs. Mm -hmm. So you would get a higher proportion of exercises and volume towards that area of your body. The next phase, once we've built up an adequate amount of volume and uh, muscle growth there, the next phase would then maybe prioritize shoulders or shoulders and arms. Mm. And we would keep adjusting and adapting depending on how you responded. Because then we might see, oh, now this has grown. Okay, this put this out of proportion a little bit. Maybe we want to address this now. But I see now the priority. And I always bias towards actually strengthening and building a foundation with the legs, glutes, and posterior chain first. Yes. So it's quite convenient. Like I would prefer to send someone there first yes. than shoulders and arms. I agree. So that's where I'm sending you first. Mm-hmm. So that could look like... That could look like around, you'll probably get around 16 to 20-ish work sets of volume uh, for the week, split over two to three sessions. And the sessions would be a hybrid. You would have, you wouldn't just, you could have a legs day, then you could have a, maybe a a hamstring glutes day with some other extreme, other parts as well. Mm -hmm. But I'll format that all for you. The specific details don't all need to be decided right at this moment. But that's how we'd begin. Yep. Next. Okay. So now we've got um, we've got days. So we're going to be working off a six day program. So tell me, tell me the split. And everybody we're listening, doing, you should be like thinking about this for your own program. So we've got our six day training program. With so when Sunday, does boxing happen? With the Sunday off. Right. I, I can choose when boxing happens, but okay. I. But spl- let's be consistent. I split it on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. I don't mind having the day in between. And that's it's morning. Nice. Yeah, morning. And the yeah, we're prioritizing the morning because of the uh, nice little lifestyle plugins, plugins that I feel like it brings. Yes. Okay. So in that case, I would structure. I play with this. I need to see. Are all the boxing sessions the same intensity? Yeah. The thing with these boxing sessions, bro. Like if I start doing boxing, bang, I'm lean. <laughs> like just like you know, I don't know what I'd sit at. I'd probably be. You'd have to say, what, 11%, 12% body fat. Can you see visible abs? You can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can do your skin folds too. Yeah. So I, we can test that if that's something important to you. Yeah, but like I said, once I plug in the boxing, it's it seems to be that, you know, I get I get lean. So that's a food adjustment thing too. Like if I don't do that, it doesn't take long before I start to put on a little bit of body fat, you know, midsection body fat. And in a muscle accrual phase, it's going to come. Yeah, yeah. Right? But the boxing... The boxing is just, it's just a nice, tra- it's all its its all I need. I don't need to be doing anything else too crazy. Like intense gym sessions and boxing, like I'm going to be lean. 
Well, that's, there you go. That You've realized how you respond to that. Yeah. So I would uh, prioritize, so legs are more neurally and muscularly intensive. They use larger muscle groups. They're more intensive on the nervous system. So I would probably put them on the single days. I correct. That's that's what I've been doing and that's what I think I should be doing. How has that been for you so far? Yeah, I think that's the way to go. Okay, so this is really important that I get feedback of what's already working for you. Because if I said put it on the boxing day, like, okay, maybe that's not ideal for what you've done. No. So you found that works. I think it's, yeah, to prioritize legs considering the, um, you know, if we were to put a metric on it out of, say, 10, the intensity of a leg session is going to be far greater than anything else. So then I would put your most intensive day on your Saturday. Guys, I'll put your most intensive day before your day off. Yeah. Right? That's going to be your opportunity to, like, maximally recover. Yeah. Right? On that day off. So if we need to cook you and stimulate some soreness, it's on that day. Okay. So that's where the most volume is probably going to come. Okay. Which is good because we have the day off on the next day. So now you've got Tuesday, Thursday. Are you saying you want to do a th- three-day some form of legs, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? It might it, it two. probably be two. Yeah, two. I think two's good. Yeah, we can hit it around two. I think two's good. It's just about hitting the volume. Um, so what do you think in Tuesday, Saturday? Tuesday, that's exactly what I got in front of me. Tuesday, Saturday. And then we work the rest around on the other days. Yeah. Cool. All right. Beautiful. Now, what's been working for you so far? Is there things that have been working really well that you want to maintain? Or is like, no, I trust you, do your thing? It's a tough one. Um, it's tough to really attribute what is the best methodology that works for me in terms of what I'm trying to... I don't think I've nailed it, but I also don't think I've given... And, you know, the last time I did was probably at a young age, but I don't think outside of a performance-based program have I really given the time and effort and consistency and patience to a genuine hypertrophic method with high volume. And so I'd be interested to see what actually does trigger best for me. Cool. Well, we're going to see. Mm. We're going to see your sleep, your nutrition. Ideally, we'd like to at least know what's coming in. Because I like it. Like I like I like lifting heavy, but then I love going high volume and just getting like a proper burn and a pump on. But then I also love eccentric tempo focus training because it's just – tear and muscle fibers apart so i like it all you know what i mean i'm sure i'm sure it all has its place but um, yeah many methods right yeah there's a lot of ways we can get here and a systemized program over a course of six to 12 plus months Mm. will touch on all of these Mm. things exactly so there's no stress on like oh no we're not doing eccentrics now i was coming Mm. patience yes (laughs) okay so we got the frequency down packed we got a lot of the parameters and principles down packed the recovery piece the phone piece the sleep piece the nutrition then is going to. Oh, I'd like to. Pl- I'd like to plug in some um, accountability around recovery as well. Yes. So sauna. Oh. When am on. I? When am I plugging my sauna in? That's probably going to be great Legs? on a Sunday. Oh, day off. Okay. It could. Yeah. It, it could be. I mean, if that's how it, many. T- you know, if I was looking at a, if I was looking at a two to three week two a two to three per week commitment, would you? Is it important to plug it in on certain days, or you don't see it as too much of a stressor? It can be mm. if, because we know sauna can stimulate the same similar effects to moderate intens- intensity uh, cardiovascular activity. Mm. Mm. We actually get uh, vascular heart adaptations from sauna. Mm. People can get fitter by just sitting there, yeah, which is like a crazy thing. Could that be a later in the day plug in on a leg day? Yes. Yeah. I, I would think, always do I it after. Like that. Yeah. Because I'm going to train in the morning. The day, the double days, yes, the weights is going to be later. But the leg days, I'm getting up in the morning and I'm getting getting after it. So I would do it on your single days. Yeah, and I'd be conscious of measuring your heart rate because if you like, okay, you can make it competitive. Like you can really start like playing mind games with yourself and push it to 140, 150 yeah, BPM. and I'm probably looking at it more so of a recovery plug in. You know what I mean? Right. I'm looking to tap into those benefits as opposed to the challenge or trying to create a workout stimulus. So in that case, I would keep your heart rate around under 130 and you can easily do your heart rate and get a clock to do that. And then just do it for just general well-being and uh, the whole host of inflammatory and brain cognitive benefits. So I would do those on the single days. Two to three times a week is a great sweet spot. We start to see a lot of the uh, longevity benefits from. And that would be a very effective program from mm. sauna to boxing to strength training and hypertrophy mm. training 
that we're ticking a lot of boxes and still plugging in that power and speed development in your warm-up sets and things mm. like that. Yeah, I like it. Sheesh. That's good. That's it. Yep, that's the one. Are there any other pieces you want to touch on? I think that's that's given us a good start, bro. It's, uh, I think we've had some really good conversation around definitely early on about the fundamentals of programming and what's important. And then obviously people giving people the opportunity to apply it to themselves. I think follow-up from here is let's design a program, let's share it, yeah. Uh, give some context to it and then we can track it and I think it'll give us a good segue into being able to talk about programming a little bit more often because, mate, we could talk about this for a long time. Yeah, you could get a, super specific yeah, in each principle. There's a lot to dive into. Yeah. And I think it's a good opportunity to sort of um, create a base level for people to dive into when they want to look at something a bit more structured because there's plenty of people that are listening right now that are desperate for something to follow desperate for a higher level program that can give them the right direction specifically towards their goals or they're actually going to the gym they're consistently training but there is no structure right. and they just want to plug into something which is back to the, the ideology of just tell me what to do and i'll do it i work best under those circumstances so, so if you're that type of person and if you're actually serious about creating a change find yourself a coach it doesn't have to be forever the things you for my clients, like I'm trying to make myself redundant. Mm. Let me teach you mm. how to fish. So then when I'm gone, you know how to do these things and manipulate programs and, and how to auto regulate your own training. However, getting someone to write an exercise, nutrition, habit, tracker, plan, all this stuff for you solves a lot of mental uh, energy and emotion and time mm. because you have it sorted. You've paid to solve a problem. Mm. Got it. Professionals handled it. He understands all these principles. She understands all of these uh, fundamentals. Now I just follow the program. And if I do it consistently, that's a wrap. That's it. Going to get the results. Good man. Another great podcast. Always, man. All right, brother. One of many. We'll talk soon, eh? See ya. <laughs> Later.